Hey guys, myself Dr. Simran and in today's video we're going to discuss about renal stones basically. Renal stones are very common so you need to know what types of renal stones are there basically. So let's get started. Now renal stones first of all are of many types basically. So the first type is, uh, let me change the color of the marker basically. Yeah. These are calcium stones, these are uric acid stones, there are cysteine stones, there are ammonium, magnesium, phosphate, uh, those are staghorn or you know, you can call it uh, ammonium, magnesium, phosphate stones. Now calcium stones are of two types, first is oxalate stone and the next one is phosphate stone. Now coming on to the important points that you need to know about the renal stones are that a non-contrast CT scan is the investigation of choice for renal stones. Why? Because it has high sensitivity and high specificity and it also detects the radiolucent stones. Now coming on to the next point. In a patient with normal renal function, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are preferred over the narcotics. Now you need to know the difference because uh, if a patient is having a normal renal function and there is a no history of previous uh, renal defect, so you can give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory dr uh, drugs rather than narcotics because narcotics can increase the nausea and the vomiting which is associated with the renal stones due to the pain. Now coming on to the next point, the next point states that the stones which are less than 5 mm in diameter typically pass spontaneously. So if the size of the renal stone is less than 5 mm then it will pass spontaneously with the conservative management. Now coming on to the conservative management, I need to tell you that the patient must take the fluid intake for mo uh, of more than 2 liters per day. This is really important that patient should consume 2 liters, more than 2 liters per day water. So as to you know pass the uh, renal stone the increased hydration is leading to the increased urinary flow rate more you hydrate yourself more there is a urinary flow rate and hence there is decreased urinary solute concentration and leading to the prevention of the stone formation this is how it leads to a prevention of stone formation now you need to know that in what cases you need to make a urology referral in case of renal stone basically it is warranted in patients with anuria in which the uh, urine output is very less or uh, um, next to nothing and in urosepsis or in acute renal failure these are the three conditions in which you need urology referral now coming on to the first type of the calcium uh, for sorry uh, first type of the renal stones these are calcium oxalate stones now basically oxalate you should know what are the oxalate containing foods oxalate containing foods are chocolate tea and peanuts etc so be careful Th those of you who love chocolates and tea like me uh, they should be really careful about calcium oxalate stones now coming on to the calcium oxalate basically the ph is decreased due to the hypocitraturia that is the citrate levels in the urine are decreased now coming on to the shape and how do they look is they look like envelope as you can see they look like envelope or dumbbell shape basically i took these images from uh, google now these are the most common type of stones 75 to 90 percent of the stones are calcium oxalate stones and what are the causes ethylene glycol or the antifreeze ingestion vitamin c abuse or increased vitamin c hypocytraturia means that the, the decreased levels of the citrate in the urine uh, now there's an important point which you need to know because this is clinically related whenever there is small bowel disease or small bowel resection or there is chronic diarrhea in all the three cases there is a malabsorption of the fatty acids as well as the bile salts so uh, what's malabsorbed uh, the fatty acids and the bile salts are not being absorbed and they lead to calcium oxalate stones but why you need to know the reason now the reason is that the failure to adequately absorb the bile salts in the state of fat malabsorption like diarrhea or resection it causes the calcium oxalate stones why because bile salt reabsorption in the small intestine uh, accessible salts may damage the colonic mucosa 
and they contribute to the increased oxalate absorption. Whenever the bile salts are not being absorbed, the excessive bile salts may damage the mucosa of the colon and they may contribute to increased oxalate absorption. And there is another high yield point which you need to know is that fat malabsorption leads to increased absorption of uh, oxalic acid because the unabsorbed fatty acids chelate the carbon uh, sorry uh, calcium so unabsorbed fatty acids they combine with calcium so that there is a lot of free oxalate or free oxalic acid available for absorption so more the oxalic acid is absorbed the more uh, there is a chance of calcium oxalate stones now coming on to the treatment it is thiazides citrates Citrates are given if there is repeated, uh, you know, history or repeated complaint of stones due to the hypocitraturia. And you should know that the patient should be given low sodium diet. If these patients continue to develop renal stones, now, supposingly you prescribe a patient a low sodium diet and thiazides, and still that patient is complaining again and again of the stones, so you should be, you know, checking uh, the urinary sodium levels just to evaluate the adherence to the sodium restriction diet because most of the patients will say that they are having the sodium restricted diet but they would be taking normal or more than normal sodium so you need to check the urinary sodium levels but the first line treatment you should know is always the easy and the simple one which is the adequate hydration if the stone size is less than 5 mm so hydration i already told you it should be more than 2 liter per day now quickly jumping on to the next slide this is the image showing how the calcium oxalate stones look like now quickly jumping on to the next slide we are going to discuss calcium phosphate stones basically calcium phosphate stones the ph is increased they are radio opaque and they are seen in primary hyperparathyroidism and renal tubular acidosis now coming on to the next important point how does hydrochlorothiazide work uh, in the uh, previous calcium oxalate stones, I told you that thiazides are used for the treatment. But how do uh, hydrochlorothiazide works? Basically, it decreases the calcium excretion in urine. So, the calcium excretion in urine is decreased. It may be used in recurrent stone formers with hypercalciuria. So, on, in those patients in which there is a history of recurrent stone formation and the urinary calcium levels are increased you may give thiazides which decrease the urinary calcium excretion now you have to remember very important clinical point that do not restrict the dietary calcium the patient may be having a myth that he or she should not have calcium because he is having the calcium stones but do not restrict the dietary calcium as it may increase the free oxalate absorption because as you decrease the dietary calcium more and more you know the oxalate uh, free oxalate is available for absorption because uh, rest of the calcium is being uh, uh, either absorbed with the fatty acids or unabsorbed fatty acids or already you are giving less calcium so more oxalate is there so there would be hyperoxaluria and urinary calcium oxalate stone formation now next coming on to the important point which is a high potassium diet how does high potassium diet help in the stones now it decreases the urina urinary calcium excretion similar to the thiazide diuretics high potassium diet also decreases the urinary calcium excretion leading to increased urinary citrate excretion which is the problem due to the urine alkalinization now what does high potassium diet do it decreases the urinary calcium excretion increases the urinary citrate excretion uh, forming the soluble calcium citrate you should know that more the citrate is there in the urine the more soluble the salts are in the urine so it it will form the soluble calcium citrate leading to decreased calcium salt precipitation now this is how uh, you know the calcium phosphate stones look like you should be familiar with their shape now coming on to the next slide now the diet rich in animal proteins are associated with increased risk of nephrolithiasis in men so for example you take a lot of meat and chicken so basically the animal protein this is a quite uh, purely a fact because it is uh, you know it is seen in many research studies that it is having an increased risk of nephrolithiasis in men now when we talk about protein malabsorption or protein sorry metabolism so whenever there is more protein metabolism there is increased acid secretion increased uric acid secretion 
now the more uric acid secretion is there the more uh, it is excreted in urine and lead to the calcium salt precipitation now coming on to the another important point that is uric acid and cysteine stones are radiolucent radiolucent on x-ray you have to remember this thing that the uric acid and the cysteine stones are radiolucent now the stones which are also minimally visible on the ct scan uh, are uric acid and which are sometimes visible visible as cysteine stones so you need to have a, a high index of suspicion that whenever you know you have a index of suspicion for a, a renal stone but you don't get to see anything you they can be uric acid or cysteine now coming on to the cysteine stones cysteine is a homodimer of cysteine and you should know how do they look basically cysteine stones are hexagonal you can see how do they look it's hexagonal six sides they are flat yellow and they are radiolucent and sometimes visible on CT scan. The pH is decreased and they are associated with cystinuria. Now you need to know this important clinical correlation because cystinuria is an autosomal recessive disorder in which there is a defective transport of the dibasic amino acids. Uh, the sodium independent dibasic amino acid transporter is defective in cystinuria. Now, what are the dibasic amino acids uh, which are malabsorbed? Uh, these are cysteine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. These are which are malabsorbed. Now, uh, their decreased absorption by the brush borders of the renal tubular and the intestinal epithelial cells. So, um, their malabsorption is there in both kidneys and intestine, and they would, you know. Uh, the cysteine reabsorbing PCT transporter loses its function. So, in the PCT, there is a cysteine reabsorbing, uh, you know, uh, transporter which is defective in case of cysteinuria. You need to know the basic defect. Now, cysteine is insoluble in urine, hence it forms the stones. Now, coming uh, now in the next slide, I'm going to show you few important hints that will aid you in making a diagnosis for cystinuria or cysteine stones. Now, recurrent stones since childhood. If a question mentions recurrent stones since childhood, they can be, you know, cystinuria. Positive family history, hexagonal crystals, positive cyanide nitroposide test. This is an important test which is done to screen, which basically this is a qualitative test to screen for the cysteine stones and it, it is particularly helpful for the diagnosis of the homozygotes. Now, what is the treatment? Low sodium diet, I already told you, urine alkalinization because uh, uh, the cysteine is insoluble in urine. Now, next is when, uh, whenever there is a refractory, uh, you know, cysteine stone, so you can uh, give uh, chelating agents. Now, next I want to tell you about uh, something about the sodium cyanide nitroprusside test, which is a very important screening test for cysteine stones. Now, cyanide converts the cysteine into the cysteine and nitroprusside is added. Whenever nitroprusside is added, it reacts with self-hydral group. Self-hydral group on the free cysteine and the red-purple discoloration. Red-purple discoloration is formed, which is a positive test. Whenever you see a red purple discoloration, that means the test is positive for cysteine stones. Now coming on to the next slide, this is uric acid stones. Uric acid stones, the pH is decreased, they look like rhomboid shape. You know, this is how the uric acid stones look like, rhomboid shape. You, know, you should remember how do they look like. Now, uh, basically, they are radiolucent on x-ray, they are visible on ultrasound and minimally visi visible on CT. What are the risk factors for uric acid stones? Gout, hyperuricemia, leukemia due to the tumor lysis syndrome, conditions of high cell turnover, uh, tumor lysis uh, syndrome also, HGPRT def uh, deficiency which is Leishan syndrome. Leishan syndrome, there is a deficiency of uh, HGPRT and hence leading to the uric acid stones. Now, what would be the treatment of the uric acid stones? Alkalinization and allopurinol plus low purine diet. These are seen in the patients with unusually low urinary pH, which may be due to a defect in the urinary ammonia excretion. So, in those patients in which the urinary ammonia excretion is low or there is hyperuricosuria, uh, the uric acid stones are seen in those patients. Now, important point 
regarding the urinary uh, you know uric acid stones are alkalinization of the urine with ph 6.0 6.0 to 6.5 with oral potassium citrate is recommended as uric acid stones are highly soluble in alkaline urine so this is an important point that we got to know that uric acids are highly soluble in alkaline environment so it is as simple as as it seems that whenever you make the urine alkaline uric acid stones will be soluble and there would be no stones in addition to the alkalinization citrate is a stone inhibitor so citrate is added which decreases the crystallization now uh, coming on to the next slide there are three possibilities you know whenever a patient has symptoms consistent with the typical renal colic whenever a patient comes to you to the opd with the renal colic but has no stones on conventional radiographs that means no stones on x-ray but he is coming with uh, you know renal colic renal colic pain so what would be the chances uh, they can be radiolucent stones uric acid or xanthan or cysteine stones also and the, the calcium stones can be less than 1 to 3 mm they can be too small to be seen you know then there is non stone ureteral obstruction there is no stone but there is a ureteral obstruction for example blood clot or tumor so you need to further investigate this now coming on to the furosemide what does furosemide do basically thiazides so i already told you that thiazides basically you know increase the urinary calcium excretion furosemide increases uh, what does uh, basically furosemide do it leads to hypercalciuria that uh, it leads to increased calcium in the urine and hence increase the risk of calcium stones as compared to the thiazide diuretics which decrease the calcium excretion and decreased calcium in urine and hence the less stone formation now coming on to the next slide the restriction of dietary sodium in the patients with calcium oxalate or recurrent renal stones now you need to know why do we need to restrict the uh, you know dietary sodium increased dietary intake of sodium will lead to increased calcium excretion that is hypercalciuria low sodium intake will lead to uh, sodium and the calcium reabsorption through its effect on the medullary concentration gradient and last but not the least the reabsorption of the sodium and the calcium is coupled via complex mechanisms involving the calcium sensing receptors csr in the thick ascending loop where the csr calcium sensing receptors are located a thick ascending loop thick ascending loop of henle so guys i hope you like this video which i made and it took me a lot of time to you know uh, just take this stuff out from various sources so please like us on facebook and instagram and subscribe to my youtube channel so that you can you know you guys can encourage me please comment on this video so that i can know what else do you want to know and how do you like this video thank you